So welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to talk about photography equipment. Maybe you're wondering what equipment a professional photographer's got to have. Well, you may be surprised. Let's go back to Lincoln and have a look. Welcome to my underground lair. It's not really a lair. It's underground, though. This is the basement of my home. I call this the gear room, and it is packed. I mean, packed, jammed, solid, full of the stuff that I take with me on assignment for National Geographic. What's down here? You name it, everything from camping supplies for 40 below zero nights to ice diving gear, dry suits, that kind of thing. Things where you could literally go under ice water and stay warm or at least alive long enough to shoot your pictures. What else? You name it, everything you can think of. This little baby right here, this is what I call the mamba box. I had this made for containing arboreal venomous snakes, climbing venomous snakes like mambas, black mambas, for example, have been in here. You don't really want them to get loose while you're shooting them, because that would be bad. Uh, what else? Oh, this was kind of bad. These are boots I wore uh, at Volcanoes National Park in Hawaii. I thought I was walking in chewing gum, but I was walking on hot lava, and that sticky sensation was the bottoms of the boots melting off. It hurt a lot. It hurt a lot. But here I am. Uh, this vest. This vest also. See how it's got these oil stains all over it? This is from covering the Gulf oil spill. So I keep it as a keepsake. and. You know, the thing about all of it, it's, it's fun to look around and it's fun to think about where all this stuff's been to every continent on earth, literally. But you don't need any of it. To be honest with you, you don't need a thing. In fact, you can leave all this stuff right here. You don't need it. Um, in fact, we are going to show you exactly what you need in the form of one backpack you can take with you on an airplane. That's it. One backpack full of gear. That's all you need. So let me ask you a question. I'm serious now, be honest. Doesn't that vest make me look fat? I don't really wanna know, don't tell me, don't be honest. So a backpack, yes really, a backpack, like this. This is what I carry. You can carry everything you need in a backpack or a camera bag, just so it's small enough to fit in a seat in front of you or an overhead bin. Well, kind of. Take a look at the gear that I have to carry on assignment for National Geographic. Amazing, isn't it? Look at this. This entire plane is full of my junk in Brazil. And the problem is with this plane, you had to be on the outside of the plane between the wings holding down a button to get the flaps to extend. There was something wrong with it and my assistant held onto my legs as the pilot flew. I got to be the guy that crawled up on the roof in flight and held the button down. I won't forget that. What else? This is the gear that I took with me just for me uh, up the Amazon River, part of the Bolivian Amazon River system. A lot of stuff. Now this though, this was in Iowa. Everything I needed, everything was in that little backpack. We we're working on, a, on an endangered snail species, believe it or not, on a real hot summer day. So even with all this stuff though, I keep the real critical gear on me at all times, right? The stuff that I have to have, man, I keep that on me. I always try to carry on everything I need, obviously, to be able to shoot if my checked bags get lost. I don't really like to check any of my critical camera gear because I don't want it stolen or damaged or just vanishing. So as these planes get smaller, I fill two little camera bags or so, do the best I can to take along what I need to get the job done. National Geographic cannot publish excuses. I cannot get off the airplane in Africa and say, oops, they lost my gear. I'm gonna take along my critical gear with me, right on. So get a good camera bag or backpack. It should be easy to open and close. It should offer enough padding to protect your equipment from the occasional bump and bruise should have a nice soft shoulder strap so it doesn't chafe you or rub holes in your shoulders. You're gonna be living with this thing. Into the camera bag go the following, and we've got it all laid out right here. A good camera, lens or two, maybe more, and a few accessories to make life easier as well. What kind of accessories? Well, if you're shooting a film camera, obviously film. For me, I shoot memory cards, so we've got a memory card wallet, batteries, extra batteries, a battery charger, very important, and a lens cloth. In my case, I just use a chamois, like something you'd use to dry your car with, nice and soft, inexpensive. You can clean it, last forever. For those of you who buy a more advanced camera, don't forget the external flash, like this one. You can do some amazing things with this as well. You need batteries for that flash, and I always use a sync cord so I can get the flash off the camera. And a lot of these flashes, you, you can do wireless as well. Very easy now, very easy. So. It all starts with that camera, doesn't it? You do not want to buy a camera that's too overly complicated or too heavy. Do not overbuy a camera system. I can't stress this enough. 
Don't try to keep up with the Joneses here. If you're a point and shoot person, you're gonna want something about the size of a pack of playing cards that you can slip into your purse or your pocket. Like I've got this right here. Look at this, little Canon G-Series camera. If this is the size of camera you wanna carry, that's fine, and I envy you a little bit. You can make great pictures with this, actually. And for the record, I've had pictures run in National Geographic with something like this. You can make lovely photos in this course with a point and shoot. We'll show you some of those coming up. Conversely, do not underbuy a camera if you have very lofty goals about being able to shoot lyrical fine art photographs or dramatic long lens shots of grizzly bears in beautiful light or taking detailed flash pictures in which you have to get that flash off the camera and really make things sing. Just ask yourself this, what is it you would like to do, really? Only you can answer this question. How much time do you want to devote and what is your budget? Our next lecture is all about lenses, so we can go into greater detail about them then. But while we're weighing whether or not to buy a point and shoot cam or something higher end, we should talk about whether or not you want to buy interchangeable lenses. Hmm, tough one. If you want interchangeable lenses, you should go with an SLR instead of a point and shoot in my opinion. SLR is short for single lens reflex. A camera that allows you to change lenses is called an SLR. SLRs have the advantage of letting you build your lens, lens collection gradually, so you don't have to shell out all your money at once. You can start off with a normal focal length lens, the kind most cameras come with. Later you can build a repertoire of lenses based on what you find yourself wanting to shoot. Now, this is all very handy, whereas with a point and shoot you're limited to whatever is built into it and whatever zoom range is on that little lens that comes with it. You'll understand these limitations better when we start talking about aperture, shutter speed, ISO, that kind of thing. When choosing lenses for an SLR, remember, you get what you pay for. In college, I had a very good professor named George Tuck, and he always said, you can buy a low-end camera, no problem, it's just a box, but buy the best lenses you can because they're both sharp and they have the ability to open way up, big holes in the lenses, these are nice, nice lenses, to allow a lot of light in and allow you to shoot in a broader range of situations, especially low light when it's beautiful. Hey, how about, you know, you want to talk about a great lens. If you look, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. It's a good thing this is just a coffee cup. Did I have you go in there? That's kind of funny, isn't it? A friend gave me this. I didn't really drop that. It actually is a little bit tippy. So, back to our show. It would cost a minute if I dropped this. This is my favorite lens, by the way, not the coffee cup, but this one right here. This is the 24 to 70, right here. This is my favorite thing. It's on this camera, it's a Nikon D3, a little bit old, and by the way, my cameras are a little bit well-worn. A lot of the paint's coming right off of them, but I find that endearing. Here's the key, make sure the camera feels comfortable in your hands. Can you reach all the controls? Here's a biggie you may not have thought of. Is it too heavy for you? You will not carry it if it's too heavy for you. If this thing was too heavy, I wouldn't want to carry it across this room right now. You may think it's okay in the camera store, but when you get it out in the field and you have to carry this thing all day, are you gonna to want to carry it for hours and hours? I bet you this weighs five pounds or so. Are you gonna to want to put it in the bag and put it in a closet and never take it out? That's where it's gonna end up, in a closet, period. That's it. So let's take a minute here too to talk about how to hold a camera properly. It can be much more comfortable and steady if you can hold this thing correctly, okay? I'm right-handed, so my left hand becomes both a camera platform and my lens control, I'll show you. Here it is, camera platform and lens control. I put the camera right there on the back. It's resting on the back of my palm. I use my thumb and forefinger to focus and to zoom. My right hand is for manipulating the dials, the settings, and for pressing the shutter. Okay, so don't hold it from above. I see this a lot, especially in movies. It drives me crazy. I know they didn't have a good consultant to show the actors how to hold their cameras. I want to be able to be stable. A geographic photographer taught me this a long time ago. You want to be able to be braced in soft, subtle light with slow shutter speeds. You want to be nice and steady and stable. There's more than one way to hold a camera, but in my opinion, this is the right way. You can really brace yourself well, and it's a comfortable way to shoot. So next, let's look at the back of the camera here and try to determine what kind of things we see. 
This is, this is basically a typical way I hold a camera. I'm usually wearing something very comfortable, and usually it says National Geographic because I get a lot of those clothes for free, to be honest with you. The back of the camera, as you can see, look at all the bells and whistles. That's complicated, isn't it? That's a, there's a lot of bells and whistles on the back of a camera. The thing is, that view screen is such a lifesaver. You really love, I love the ability to see the pictures I've just taken. And I'm constantly looking at that review screen on the back, constantly. It's called chimping. You know why it's called chimping? Because when digital cameras first came out, I find this very funny even to this day, you would get a picture on the back and people would look at this picture. When, when they'd shoot it, they'd look immediately. And they go, ooh, ooh, ah, ah, ooh, ooh, ah, ah, like that, like a chimp. So we still call it chimping. I'm constantly looking or chimping at the back of my camera to see how the exposure is, how the focus looks, how the composition is, you name it. That, that little screen on the back that shows me my pictures is so handy, I cannot tell you. Also, you're gonna want a tripod. A good tripod is one of the nicest, cheapest things to have, I cannot tell you. Look at this. A tripod is such a blessing, and it really improves photography. A tripod eliminates camera shake, because basically, the tripod bolts the camera to the earth. Bolts it to the ground, doesn't it? Be sure your tripod can easily hold the weight of your camera and your largest lens. This tripod, I could sit on this thing and it'd be fine. If you have a giant honking lens and you don't want to get a flimsy little tripod, then do you? You want something heavy. This isn't even a very heavy tripod and I'm putting all my weight on it and it's just fine, okay? Now you don't need a tripod that weighs 50 pounds like one that's used by a TV crew, but you do want a good tripod. Let's take a look. This is just typical, typical tripod. This is what I use out in the field all the time. You need one other thing with a tripod. There's one other thing. I know I brought one here. Here it is. It's not very expensive, but boy, is it important. This is called a cable release. What's a cable release? This is just a little device. It's literally a cable. It releases the shutter remotely, only this far away. Why do you want to do that? Because when your finger presses down, on the camera, when you're doing a very slow exposure, very slow shutter, you'll jiggle that camera and it will ruin it. It'll ruin it with camera shake. So we use cable releases a lot when we're doing very, very long exposures using a tripod. So, do your homework, you guys. It's getting a little complicated, but not bad. I really suggest, really do, after this lecture, that you go to your local camera dealer local camera store, and ask for their help and advice. Try a wide variety of cam camera lenses right in the store. Do not buy stuff online without actually having tried the gear out for yourself, please. In fact, I would suggest you go to your local camera dealer, you take their time, you ask them the questions about the lenses and the cameras, you get a feel for it, you shoot with it a little bit, and then you pay a little extra and actually buy it from your local dealer. They'll stand behind the gear. A lot of times online companies will not. So that's really, it's really just the right thing to do, folks. If you chew up a local camera store's time, buy your gear from them. You'll be glad you did, okay? Now, I know that I told you everything you really need to know that would fit in it, that, that you need is in a backpack. But the truth is, I try not to even carry a bag if I'm gonna be on my feet all day. I have a secret weapon. I use a photo vest. You've seen this a lot, haven't you? Photo vest. This is a photo vest I wear all over the world. Ugh, a little stinky. It smells a little like Africa still. It's a little dirty, I have to tell you. I wear this photo vest and this carries everything I need. Why do I do this? Because it distributes weight evenly and I don't want to wreck my shoulders. That feels good. So watch this. Into this vest will fit everything. Everything, even this nice little big lens here, 7200. Everything I have on this table will fit into this backpack. Lenses, flashes, look at this. I've got so many pockets. I can even take my lens coffee cup with me if I wanted to, right? Most camera stores sell vests like this in all shapes and sizes. So this is actually a very, very slick thing to have. Note I have very deep pockets here on the side. My pockets are that deep, that deep. That way I can put anything I can think of into this and look at that. They all zip up. You know why they zip up? It's to keep things more secure. That's why they zip up. Stuff can't fall out if it's zipped up. If I'm on a horse that runs away on me, or if I'm in a big crowd and there's pickpockets, look at this. It's harder to get into something if it's zipped up. It's harder for me to spill stuff, right? Not only is this stuff more secure because it's in these deep pockets, 
but it distributes the weight more evenly yet. It doesn't feel like I'm carrying all this heavy gear. The heaviest thing I carry is the camera around my neck when I'm going after it like this. Another thing about a photo vest is it frees your hands up. Look at this. I've got all my gear on me, and yet my hands are still free. Yeah, one hand, I always put my strap around my neck, by the way, always, always. One hand can hold the camera, adjust, zoom, and focus. The other presses the buttons. You go in into here. If you, I was fighting with a camera bag as well, that's a lot more of a problem. It's a hassle. And if you sit it down, it can get dirty or stolen. All the gear is off the ground. All the gear is with me. This is great. So really, this is the stuff you need. Whatever gear you have, the more familiar you are, by the way, with your equipment, the better your pictures will be. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you the basic controls on a camera now, the fundamental foundation. This information, it all starts here. You can make great pictures, by the way, with any camera. I want to stress that. Any camera. Can you believe that? But to take full advantage of the techniques we're going to tell you about in this course, you're going to want to have a camera that allows you to experiment with a wide range of these things. Aperture, shutter speed, ISO. Going to need to know, you're going to need to know all of it. So let's start out with the setting for aperture on this camera. Okay, Aperture, what is it? It's the hole in the lens. How big or small that hole is determines how much light comes through the lens. The aperture function on your camera makes the hole bigger or smaller. Put that strap around my neck again. You know why? Because I have dropped lots and lots of cameras on the ground by not having that strap. Always do it. Always. Okay? So with apertures, these different hole sizes, we call them f-stops or just stops. An aperture setting of f16 or f11 is a fairly tiny hole. An aperture of f28 is a big hole in the lens. Now, why should you care about the size of the hole in the lens? Well, the size of the hole or aperture setting, it determines how much of the image is in focus. And it also determines how much light gets through. So why wouldn't you want to shoot everything on, let's say, f16, tiny hole? Everything would be in focus, all your problems would be solved, right? Not so fast. Most of the time, contrary to what you've been led to believe, you want very few things in focus, believe it or not. That's because the world's a chaotic place, and I want my subject to be in focus, and the rest of the world can go a little soft or out of focus, as far as I'm concerned. I want to get an impression of where we are in the background, but I don't need to see sharp detail in everything else in the background, really, most of the time. I want the focus to be on my subjects, largely my family members or whatever, or whoever I'm shooting for National Geographic. If you have everything in your focus, if you have everything in focus, how are you ever going to isolate your subject amid the chaos of life and make it stand out? We'll talk about this much more in later lectures. Let's take a look here. Now let's look at this picture. In this case, there were so many tree limbs behind us that the right choice was a small aperture number to create a big hole in the lens to blur the background. That's the way to go. It's a really lovely professional look, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, another control on the camera is shutter speed. Shutter speed determines how long the shutter stays open to expose light to the sensor. The shutter is a curtain of blades that regulate the time the light gets in. That's all it is. Shutter speed is easier to understand in that way than, than aperture. It's the amount of time that the sensor is seeing what your lens is focused on. I want you to be shooting in very soft, graceful light. I don't want you shooting into the blazing sun when your subject is squinting and sweating uncomfortably. We're going to work in beautiful, soft, graceful light, okay? But graceful light, that's weak light. And it requires a big home lens to gather up whatever light is there, whatever light we can. That light is so weak sometimes and so beautiful and soft and fragile and delicate, it can barely get into your film or sensor. So you need a big hole to allow as much light as possible to come in while that shutter stays open. Now, you can't just leave your shutter open a long time, though, for two reasons. First, because we breathe and we're shaky. <laughs> Even when we're trying to hold still, we move a little bit. If you're holding a camera, hand-holding, with a slow shutter speed, things can get blurry, can't they? Because you're moving a little bit. And your subject's probably going to be moving, too. If you have a lively subject, you'll probably need a faster shutter speed. A turtle sitting still does not need a fast shutter speed. Well, let's say a baseball player sliding into home might. Let me explain how these two things, aperture and shutter speed, work. This is one of my favorite little metaphors, the kitchen sink example. 
Imagine you're standing at your kitchen sink. Think of the water as light, and the sink is the camera's light-sensitive sensor or film. How much water gets into that sink is determined by a faucet, right? Okay, there's only two functions on a faucet. How much you open it up, and for how long. How wide open it goes, and how long. In a nutshell, that's the same way the two basic camera controls work. Aperture is how much you open up the hole in the lens, and shutter speed is the amount of time it's open. That's simple. The more open the hole in the lens, and the longer time it's open, the more light comes through your lens and hits that sensor. The shutter regulates the time the light gets in, and the hole in our lens, or the aperture, is how far open or closed our spigot is. I really want you to make sure you understand this, because these two controls are the very foundation of still photography. Most good cameras are going to have shutter speeds that go from many seconds all the way to a thousandth of a second or even faster. Generally speaking, I, I like to say you want a shutter speed of a 60th or 125th of a second, fairly fast shutter speeds. You'll need that fastest shutter speed to keep images sharp because things are moving in front of your camera and as we hold the camera, we're moving too. Aperture, the hole in the lens, and the shutter speed are tied hand in hand, they always walk together to create proper exposure. If one is shifted, the other must be also, and in different ways depending on the intensity or brightness of the light you're in. They always change together. A higher shutter speed, a faster shutter speed, means you need a bigger hole in the lens to let in more light most of the time. A smaller hole in the lens, tiny hole in the lens, means you want to have a slower shutter speed because a slower shutter speed will allow the same amount of light in through that tiny hole. If you can understand that, you've got it. You got all the technical informa information you need for photography. To me, that's it, the end. It's not, not really a technical course. It's about good seeing and thinking. Almost, almost. There is a third control on a camera. There is. It's called ISO, which is the film's or sensors sensitivity to light. In low light situations, you want that sensitivity to be very high, and you want that sensitivity to be low in really bright situations. Now, why do you care how much light gets to the sensor? If too much light gets to the sensor, it's absolute toast, that's why. Look at this, too much light on my assistant Grace. Wow, look at that, blinding white. Just blows it away, no detail at all, no good. No good at all. Now, conversely, check this out. If you don't allow enough light onto your sensor film, it's like that. Way too dark. You can't see a thing. It's black. A happy medium is where you want to be. Set that ISO depending on the time of the day and the lighting conditions, okay? ISO, together with shutter speed and aperture, are the basic controls of your camera. Most cameras now have automatic controls for aperture and shutter speed to give you a perfect exposure every time. When I was starting out in photography 25, 30 years ago, whatever it was, it took some work to get a perfect exposure. Nowadays, you can do it all automatic. Do I want you to be thinking about how it works and learn how to do it yourself on manual? Yes, I do. But listen, you could get through this entire course just using automatic settings if you wanted to coast. You could, but what fun is that? Come on. I'm gonna try to help you be in control of things. I want you to understand how these functions work and how they relate to how they relate to each other. You're really going to feel empowered. You're going to feel good about it. For this course, really, you're going to want a camera that gives you the option to shoot in aperture priority, shutter priority, and manual. Aperture priority means you choose the aperture and the camera will set the appropriate shutter speed to make the correct exposure. Shutter priority means you choose the shutter speed and the camera will set the appropriate aperture, the hole in the lens, to make the correct exposure. Wow, either way you go, shutter or aperture priority, you'll make a perfect exposure, okay? Full manual mode is when you pick both, but that's a lot to think about in addition to light composition, all the other stuff we're trying to get into. So for right now, I'm gonna let you stick with aperture and shutter priority, just baby steps right now. I have to tell you most of the, most of the time though, when I'm on assignment for National Geographic Magazine even, I shoot on aperture priority. This allows me to control the depth of field that I get, the amount of image that's in sharp focus, and what's in softer focus. Besides, most of the time, I'm shooting in such soft light that I want the maximum sized hole in the lens that I can get, usually f2.8. 
So I choose that, shoot in low light, and then let the camera choose the right shutter speed. It makes life a lot less complicated, allows me to get fast happening situations, things that I don't really have time to think about exposure because they're going so quickly in front of me, and it allows me to really change up quickly. The ISO, by the way, has to be set by you, the photographer. Unless you're shooting in a full automatic mode, the ISO is your camera's sensitivity to light. High, strong light, you'll want to have a low ISO. Low light, high ISO. My high-end Nikon cameras allow me to go to 5,000 ISO, 6,400 ISO, and higher than that even. That means I can shoot handheld, steady with no tripod, almost at night now, in total darkness just about. If I can see it, I can get a picture of it, and that's remarkable. When I started in photography, we had 50 ISO, 50 ISO color film. We could only shoot when the light was really strong. So we've gone from 50 to 5,000 or higher in the expanse of my career. It's amazing. This is a great time to get into photography, you guys. So hopefully you get this now and you have a real feeling for it. There's no substitute for an in-person demonstration when it comes to getting a feel for gear. And that's why I said, go to your local camera store. Go to a friend's house who has the same gear as you want to buy. Then practice with it. Hold it in your hands. See how it feels, whether it's too heavy. Understand the basics of what you are getting yourself into, okay? So your assignment. I want you to take a picture of one subject using many different settings on your camera. Take a look at how each setting changes the photograph of your object. If you're ambitious, you can label each one to help you remember. So I did this. I did this. I want to do things along with the course. I did this with my little boy, Spencer. He is obviously extremely excited to be helping his father, as are his other brother and sister. He'd be assisting me in this fine photo exhibition here. Anyway, he's holding up a little card right in front of him. For example, this one says a thousandth of a second at f2.8. Now you notice, no depth of field, big hole in the lens, no depth of field, just Spencer and that little piece of paper is sharp, okay? You can set your, you can check your settings quite easily on most digital SLRs, can't you? Usually with a little dial or a button right on the back of the camera. So what about this one? Look at this one. Oh, this is a little bit slower, isn't it? Much slower shutter speed. Now we're at F16, smaller hole. Look, everybody's in focus. The kids still aren't very happy about having to pose for dad, but now there's lots more depth of field. Just in these two pictures, we can see it. Look at this. Big hole in the lens, no depth of field. Small, tiny hole in the lens, F16, lots of depth of field. Irritated kids in both. In our next lecture, we'll talk about lenses and focal length. We just touched on these things here. But next, we're going to be talking about choosing the right lenses and focal lengths for the kind of pictures you want to take. It's very important, but it's also fun. I love lenses. They feel good, you know? There's so many choices, and all could be potentially different tools in your toolbox. You wouldn't want to try driving a nail using a screwdriver, right? It's as simple as that. So go give that assignment a try and see what you can learn about that camera of yours or what kind of camera you want to get. And after the next lecture, you're going to have even more interesting choices to make with your pictures. We'll see you then.